Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, part two, uh, Reconquista. This fits in pretty well with... I have one more uh, Spread of Islam video. How you guys doing? Doing good? Good? Great? If you're not, that sucks. You'll be good soon. But uh, the Spread of Islam video and, you know, the Rome stuff and Belisarius, Justinian, um, fall of the Western Roman Empire, recapture, refall. And so this actually, you know, fits in nicely with all that other stuff. Let's get right into it. I'd recommend watching part one. That's up to you. Either my reaction to it or straight from the source. Let's go. This was really good. Part one was good. Oh, we're doing a recap. Oh, that's nice. All right. All right, so by 720, they're almost the entire peninsula, except for the far north where Christians are. All righty. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. Omek is down the hall. Make me a pizza. This was the year that the king, who was now Alfonso III, was forced by his own family at gunpoint, or I should say sword point, to abdicate the throne and divide Asturias into three parts. Of which, in the year 924, one of the newer states, Lyon, managed to conquer the other two and establish the Kingdom of Lyon. The Reconquista was beginning to warm up, but if you read Sun Tzu, he'll tell you that the first thing you need to do is establish a justifiable cause for fighting. And again, having a All super flag. powerful militant saint like Santiago Matamoros helps this along nicely. Catlus goes into the method of how the historians of that time galvanized the people and established the justification for the reconquest. Quote, The histories from the era of Alfonso III and those composed in the 11th century and later were written by foreign clergymen who had an explicit commitment to supporting the political supremacy of the Leonese monarchy. They happily invented histories, forged documents, concocted genealogies in order to frame the history of Spain in terms of the grand Christian-Muslim conflict. These histories conceived of the world in terms of celestial struggle. Their language was biblical and their rhetoric apocalyptic. For them, the Christians of Spain were the true Israel, a people chosen by God but cast... Spanish are doing a very good publicity campaign. ...down for their disobedience and sin and who are now called on to reclaim their rightful place through inner piety. Israel, Sorry. a people chosen by God but cast down for their disobedience and sin, and who are now called on to reclaim their rightful place through inner piety and earthly battle against the infidel. Now, Catalyst goes on to explain even more. Quote, the narrative that they crafted, one of an eternally united Spain, defeated by foreign Muslims, but then gloriously reclaimed through a process of crusade and reconquest, is no less false than the legends of Clavijo, Santiago, and Pelagius. But in its dramatic simplicity and self-affirming moralization, it has exercised an incredible appeal, both in Spain and elsewhere." End quote. The history of Lyon dates back to Roman times. The city was founded as a military outpost by the Roman Legio Septima Gemina. As such, she had city walls and fortifications and made a natural fort base, not to mention a good capital. She was incorporated into Astorias in 742, but as mentioned became a state of her own when Astorias was partitioned. Now it would be under her new and somewhat belligerent king, Ordoño II, that she would fight and eventually overrun her Christian neighbors, and thus unify northwestern Spain. But it wasn't going to be until 931, under Ramiro II, that Leon began to really rise to prominence. Ramiro II pushed her borders east, nearly to the Pyrenees, and took the city of Burgos and the surrounding land. This land would soon be known as the County of Castile. Much more on that in just a little bit. Ramiro was a prominent military figure and the people of Al-Andalus would affectionately refer to him as the devil. You see, it was under his administration that he went toe to toe with the Muslims of the South. 
In 939, the Emir, now Caliph of Cordoba, led a massive army into the north to teach the Christian king. It's strange that such a religious um, people would, would use that title. I, I get what they're trying to mean, like the devil to the uh, Muslim um, population. Caliph of Cordoba led a massive army into the north to teach the Christian kingdoms a lesson. This caliph was none other than Abd al-Rahman III, one of the greatest rulers of Al-Andalus, and at the time was riding high on his military successes. In fact, he was so confident that he was leading his own men personally on campaign. Abd al-Rahman III had unified most of Al-Andalus at this point and had been victorious during his famous Muez campaign about 20 years earlier. It was during this campaign that he not only torched Pamplona, but also wrecked the combined forces of Leon and Navarra. He was now in the north to essentially finish the job. But Ramiro II was not one to be pushed over very easily. He set up an ambush, and the caliph, who felt a little too secure in his supremacy, in fact, he even called his campaign omnipotence, rode right into the trap. Hockey. At the Battle of Samancas in 939, the Leonese king destroyed the Muslim army and came within a hair's breadth of killing the caliph himself. Wow. It was due to victories like this that Leon was able to expand. She now encompassed the southern portion of the Duero River Valley. Again, it was a bit of a wasteland, but whichever way you look at it, the border between Cross and Crescent was moving south. And in the process... Is it really that much of, of a desert wasteland? Um, the lands of Alandal... Been there, living there? ...loose had been diminished. And in the process, the lands of Al-Andalus had been diminished. However, that all said, the Reconquista was then going to be put on hold for the next 100 years. Jesus. Abd al-Rahman III came to power in the year 912. He inherited a land that was on the verge of collapse. After a series of, well, how else can you say it, stunning military campaigns, he restored his emirate to military power and ushered in a golden age for his economy. In 929, he declared himself Abd al Muminin, which meant commander of the faithful. Hence, he made himself caliph and turned his emirate into a caliphate. Al Andalus was transformed under his leadership from a regional power to an international one and regarded by some historians as the superpower of Western Europe. This was a time when Cordoba rivaled Constantinople and Baghdad in population and sophistication and was regarded by the court of the Holy Roman Empire as the ornament of the world. This was a time when- Okay, I didn't realize just how solidified the uh, caliphate was in Spain. I knew it had reached there and the Muslim conquest had reached there but I wasn't sure how solid it was. And so there has to be still a ton of, I mean, it is a thousand years ago. I don't know how much architecture could survive, but I, I wonder what sort of Muslim little hints in archaeology you can find in, in Spain, southern Spain especially. When Abd al-Rahman III and Constantine VII of the Byzantine Empire had an unusually warm and close relationship with exchange of diplomats and knowledge, in fact, if you ever go to the Great Mosque of Cordoba, you can see Arabic inscriptions okay. that are created that using Byzantine craftsmen with imported Byzantine mosaic. This was a period where Abd al-Rahman's son, al-Hakam II, created a library that held, it was said, 400,000 books. But this was also a time when the Caliphate of Cordoba held supremacy over the peninsula savagely putting down rebellion when she had to, and terrified the Christian kingdoms of the north, who she raided with near impunity. When the usurper, Al-Mansur, took control of the Cordoban government, he only intensified the strength of the army and brought Al-Andalus to the pinnacle of her military prowess. During his reign, he led over 50 campaigns. In 985, he left Barcelona a burning pile of rubble, and in 997, he breached the sanctity of Santiago de Compostela deep within Galicia. 
While he was there, he demolished her cathedral and stole the sacred shrine's bells. As Professor Catless masterfully puts it in his book, the caliphate at this point held the Christian kingdoms by the bells. But in the end, just as massively did the caliphate rise, so did she fall. Extensive internal upheaval, persistent rebellions, and a disaffected populace brought down the mighty state in a fury. And by the year 1031, the caliphate was abolished and replaced by a fragmented mess of competing and petty typhus states. It was time now for the Christian kingdoms to rise to predominance once again. And in the northeastern part of the peninsula, a small Christian enclave would seek her destiny. Um. Okay, that, that was pretty short. It, it was good, and it's right on the cusp of, seems like, the real fall of the uh, Muslim rulers and, and the Reconquista really starts, but I think that's a good start, a good place to start next time. And I didn't really plan to do much today, and I did uh, this one in the Quick History Matters video. Interesting. And the more I watch this, the more I just, I'm, I'm like, okay, now I want to see how this eventually leads to you know, Cortez and, and, and the Spanish Empire, and then eventually the New World, and that can clear up that fog of war over there. So I'm excited. Again, slow day today. I know I didn't put out very much. I'll be back more more stuff tomorrow. See you guys next time.